This morning, if you join me in taking your Bibles to the book of Psalms, we've been doing a verse-by-verse study through the book of Acts. And uh, so, and be honest with you, I feel like I have been gone all of August, to be honest with you. We're going to start August over again. So um, the, the first, I think I was here the first week, and then uh, COVID hit our house. It wasn't me, it was just my daughter, who's now, now at college. So we had to take the next two weeks off. You know, I, I tell you what, there's nothing more boring than being perfectly healthy and sitting home doing nothing. Some of you, that's living the dream. Uh, hey, let me sit and watch nothing but Netflix for the next two weeks. For me, about day two, I, don't get me wrong, day one was pretty nice. I won't deny that, all right? I don't have to do anything. Day two, I was going crazy. So we were in quarantine, and then we were here for a week, and then took my daughter down to Pensacola Christian College in Florida, and uh, we were there for a few days, went to church with her last Sunday. And uh, so it's interesting, she's grown up in churches like this, and if you know anything about Pensacola, their auditorium has to seat around seven or 8,000 people. So you walk in, you're like, what in the world? She pulled in. She'd never been on campus. So I, at one point, she looked at her dorm. She goes, my dorm's bigger than my life and anything she's used to. And uh, so we chatted with her yesterday. She's having a great time, enjoying herself. And uh, right down when hurricanes are coming through, of course, through Louisiana. And uh, but so it's nice to be back. Now, next Sunday, we'll have a specific message strictly for, um, specifically for Community Day, and so I, and I was praying about it. I had a message prepared from the book of Acts, and God just kept leaning me back to this chapter. Now, if you follow along in our podcast, A Source of Truth, which is a daily devotional, you'll notice, I think it was Tuesday, we talked about sections. We started, or Monday and Tuesday, we started in Psalm 86. I'll be honest with you, this chapter has stuck with me all the way throughout the week, and uh, so today we're going to just focus our attention just on a couple verses from the book of Psalm chapter 86. Before we do this, I, I, have, to, I have to do this. Mr. and Mrs. Bokiko, welcome back. It's good to see you. The last time I saw them, they were getting married, so I just had to say hi. I saw them sneaking in, so I had to point them out. I mean, it's good to see you again. Welcome back. Uh, Psalm chapter 86, would you follow along as I read, beginning in verse number 10. David said this, for thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. Father, as we look at this passage that you've laid upon our heart today, I pray it'll be a help. I pray, Father, it'll be exactly what we need. For some, a great source of encouragement. For some, a challenge. As we evaluate and teach the thought of you uniting our heart. Father, we live in a day of distraction. Some through the extremes from the storms and COVID and political unrest. Father, um, some from social media and all the things that consume us from our own thoughts and our own concerns and for these few minutes, would you help us to be able to bring our thoughts into captivity to the Word of God and what it means to unite our hearts to fear you. I pray, Father, you speak to our hearts in these few, in these few moments today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was growing up, one of the things that you know, was unique, and some of you are in a similar scenario, I grew up in a, in a Christian home, a pastor's home for that matter. So I was born, two weeks later I was in church, and it was required in my home to do that. Now, I'm out of the home now, I'm in my own home, and I've chosen to do this. And personally, I love church. I know you think I'm paid to say that, all right, and kind of am a little bit, but I love church. I love coming to church. I love worshiping. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've watched several of the services here online, and I love having the technology. I love the fact that I can watch what's going on and keep up, listen to the messages. It's just not the same. And I'm not trying to begrudge anybody watching online. I'm glad you're watching online. But you know what? You know, I, I'm, I, I, I want to start singing, and I start singing, and the people in the room are like, what's wrong with that guy over there, right? And it's just, it's just not the same. It's something different about being in a pew and hearing people around you sing and being surrounded by God's people. And there's just, it's needful. And so when I, when I think about growing up in church and things of that nature, one of the things that I've learned is there's a big difference between having a lot of knowledge about church and Christianity and about God and to be mature in Christianity. 
All right? uh, the Bible tells us in the book of James, uh, let, um, count it all joy when you find yourself or fall into diverse or numerous different types of temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, that what God's doing in our life is developing patience. How many of you wish you had more patience? How many of you know praying for patience is not smart? All right. You ever done that? Lord, give me patience. All right, I'm going to make traffic for work the rest of the week as miserable as possible. You're going to go three miles an hour to work on 95 every day. You're going to learn patience. How many know that doesn't usually develop patience? All right? Usually that part of me that no one wants to know comes out in that time. Just last Thursday, my son's taking us down to the, a week ago Thursday to the airport as we're getting ready to fly down to Pensacola. It was one of those days, that morning, we got up, and uh, my son, my youngest son had his cast taken off that day, and then we took him to his first day of school. And then we waited, and he came home, and we saw him, said, hi, how was the first day of school? He goes, great, 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 see you in five days. And we got in a car and went down to the airport to take our daughter to college. Well, we're on 95. You know what I've learned? Cotman Avenue is always backed up, no matter what time of the day it is. It could be four in the afternoon, four in the morning. I think the state of Pennsylvania pays people just to drive through Cotman Avenue. I really do. It's constantly, and everybody thinks if I go 100 miles an hour where it merges, I'll get there first. Well, all it does is mean there's just more people fighting when you get to the merge. I'm like, it's, it's merging from four to three lanes. This isn't rocket science. Why does it back it up to Academy Road? And we get on there, and I'm like, you know, we took off in plenty of time. But we're sitting there, and I just, it just tests your patience, doesn't it, when you're sitting there? And, and the funny part was, my, my son, he, he, he was driving a little bit like me. I don't like being close to the person in front of me. I don't, all right? You know, and he probably normally drives closer, but he had two old backseat drivers named parents in the car. So to be any closer than he was, he knew, we're holding on to the car for life, you know. You're not going to stop in time. You know, old people, we like to have five bustlings between us and the car in front of us. So... He's relaxing, the guy in front of us pulled up and stopped and go traffic, and the guy behind us apparently thought we weren't close enough. I understand, you pull up and you stop. So it's like, you know, that extra 10 feet really would have gotten us to the airport faster. So this guy behind in, in his fancy sports car, he flies around and he spins in between us and the car. I mean, he almost hit the two cars. And my first reaction was I felt bad that he almost damaged that car. And then I kind of wish he had damaged that car, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, it's, that's not Christian. No, it's me in traffic. But he, he waves his hand out to wave us to go to the other lane, and then he gives us his IQ. And then we keep driving. Some of you have figured out that is later. And I'm like, someone's not really happy in traffic. That doesn't help develop patience. And then you got to get in line at the airport. All right? Now, when God says, let the trying of your faith work patience, why? So that patience may develop Maturity, that you may be perfect and entire. The word perfect means complete, mature. You know, when we look at certain situations, and this time in our day has really tested this, where you wonder, how mature are we? Do you remember, some of you remember this when you were a kid, some of you remember your younger kid, you know, when your kids come up and they, you put out a meal, and on it has got broccoli or some vegetable that they don't like, all right? And it's just, you know, how many of you agree broccoli's nasty, all right? All five of us, mostly my family, I'm embarrassed right now, okay? <laughs> so whatever you don't like, all right? If you like broccoli, okay, they give you chocolate. Whatever you don't like. You remember when your kids start screaming and fighting, I don't want to eat this? Oh, you're going to eat this. And you're going to sit here until you do. And that kid's like, I got endurance. I got all week. I can do this. In, my la in our last church, there was a family um, he told us something. He, this is what his wife said they did. We heard this, and we're like, we're not doing this. They, they wanted to force their kids to make sure that they would eat everything on their plate. They took this to an extreme. So for dinner, they bring out an entire meal and put it out, and they told them, you have to eat all of this. And so if the, the three young girls, if the girl didn't eat it, they would wrap it up, put it in the refrigerator, and they had the rest for breakfast. And if they didn't eat that, it was wrapped up, and they came home, and that was lunch and dinner. And they didn't move on to the next meal until that plate was empty. My first thought was, is that even healthy? That was my first thought in some of these things. But I looked out, I'm like, my wife did that to me, I'd never eat. I just wouldn't be able to. You know, she puts things, she's, you want anything left over? Leftovers, no, I cannot stand them. I, I don't care how many are in there. My wife's like, this is my daughter. She takes leftovers, she loves them. When I look at leftovers, I'm like, we were supposed to throw those away yesterday. Why are we eating them today? It's just, I know, I'm, I'm weird, but maybe picky. 
But you know, if you think about this, and this five-year-old or 15-year-old kid, whatever it is, sitting at the table whining over what they want to eat, do you, don't you think it'd be strange if now that you're older and wives, you put out this meal you've prepared, and your 30, 40, 60, 90-year-old husband comes and sits at the table and begins to whine about not wanting to eat what you put in front of him. Don't you think that'd be a little silly, right? You'd be like, will you grow up a little bit? I don't want to eat this. I wanted this. Can you imagine that? I, I, I'll be honest with you. When I think, I can't imagine Mr. McKenna sitting at the table complaining to Mrs. McKenna about the food. I can't imagine that. They're saying that does happen. Either way, I, uh, he would just go kill something and eat it, all right? That's what he would do. He would just go hunt and solve the problem. I'll be honest, you don't see that. When I think of Mr. McKenna, I think of the big, strong, you know, former police officer, chief of police, all this. I don't see him whining at the table about what to eat. Why? Because he wouldn't. He's mature. I, that's what we, go, we grow into. Now, all of that scenario in everyday life would be silly. But here's a question. How many of us know somebody or are somebody that in our Christian life we've been saved for a period of time, and yet when things come into our life that are overwhelming, we act like the five-year-old at the table? We immediately think God hates us. God's not working. How dare he do this? This isn't fair. And we immediately begin to become angry and frustrated over what God's not doing for us. Because we haven't grown in maturity. And what did James say? Let the trying of your faith develop patience, which develops maturity. We don't like that, though. We don't like that level of maturity. I dare say, from 20 years of being in ministry, there are some people who will never get beyond three years old in Christianity. They don't follow the Bible, they don't read it, they don't, they don't obey it. They have their own opinion of what Christianity is. And no one, including Jesus in the Bible, is going to change that. And that's disappointing because it, it breeds into their family, it breeds into other people. This morning, I want to preach for a few minutes on something God has just been working in my heart about, this idea of unite my heart from Psalm chapter 86. And we're going to look at just a, a couple quick verses. And really what it does is how do we get to the point of that level of maturity? Let's look at a couple of things. Number one, in, this, in verse 11, we see a supernatural instruction. He tells us in verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Just before verse 11, back in verse 10, he says, For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Catch this, thou art God alone. Can I encourage you on something that many would consider very simplistic, but I'm not convinced it is. And I just want us to think about this. And when I say this, this is one of those things that really hit me this week. As God was working in my heart on something, and I just didn't want that. So I kind of fought him this week. You say, you're a preacher. You're not supposed to do that. We do that. All right? We do. We fight that. Probably more than you do, to be honest with you. Things we want our way. But the he, thou art God alone. You know the word in there that grabs my attention? Alone. Now, I could talk about the idea that we put other things in our life that go above God, you know, and, you know, this is more important than God, and work's more important than God, and money's more important than God, but that's actually not where I'm heading with this. We do that, but that's not where I'm heading with this. You know, one of the reasons we never hit maturity and we struggle with listening to supernatural instruction is God's not God alone. You know who the other person is that's God in my life? Me. And the moment things aren't going my way, I get angry at the other God. Now, I wouldn't call him the other God, but I get angry at him. Lord, why did you let this happen? Now, here's, here's what happened, all right? So here I'm in a circumstance or in a situation, and as far as I can see from my human mind, this is where I need to go. I need to get to this point, and I believe that's where I should be. That's a good place. And so I pray to that end. God, get me here. God, do this. God, do that. And God has said, you know, you are here, and you're right, but I'm not going to take you there. I'm going to take you here. The problem is we don't want to go there. No, we're, we're going here. And it makes sense. And God, we could do so many good things for you right here. And look how this can happen. And Lord, Lord, you could do so many good things right here. And God says, oh, I know, I can do that. But I'm taking you here. But Lord, I don't like that road. It's, it's bumpy. It's bumpy. The other day I read an article, uh, just the title of an article in Pennsylvania. Someone said, tra well, a national travelers vote Pennsylvania to have the best roads in America. And then the subtitle, Pennsylvanians disagree. I was driving the bus home from camp just a couple weeks ago. This really cracked me up. I'm driving down the turnpike. I got both my hands on the steering wheel as bus drivers are supposed to. I have my smartwatch on, and my smartwatch vibrates. So I look to see who's texting me. And you know what I see? You're exercising, and it's got a bicycle right there. 
All I was doing was holding on to the steering wheel. But the bus was bouncing so much, my wife, my wife thought I was exercising. I wasn't, all right? I had a soda in the cup holder, and I was not exercising by any stretch. And I'm thinking, the roads are not great in Pennsylvania by any stretch of magic. I thought the bus was going to fall apart. It was so bad. But we don't want to go down this path because we can see all the things. And here's the problem. We don't know what the other end of it is. But, God, we want to be here because we know or we think we know what's going to happen. And God says, I know. I want you to trust me. But we don't want to trust him. And so in prayer, in church, in our devotions, we're begging God to do this, to fulfill this, to open these doors. And God says, listen, I've closed these doors. This is where I want you to go. We don't like it. That could be a different job. It could be a different circumstance, a different situation, an answer to prayer. And God says, go this way. I've got something great on the other end, but we can't see it. We can't control it. And so we come back here, and we will spend the rest of our life begging God to get us there, and we'll never do it because he wants us here. And so we get out of church. We walk away from God. We do all of this because we're angry. God's not moving. God doesn't love me. God loves us greatly, and he's got an amazing plan. We just won't follow it. It's one of the hardest things we'll do. And you know what we have to do? We have to at some point say, Lord, this is what I want, but I trust you. Remember we've said more than once, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understandings. Don't trust what you think. This is my path. It seems different. You can only see a few feet. That's why God says, my word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. God's not going to tell you what's coming next year. He may tell you what's coming today. Just follow him today. But see, I think I can control this. And God says, nope over here. But if I'm not willing to submit to that phrase, thou art God alone, and say, God, I, I, I'm nervous. I don't understand this. We can be honest. Lord, I don't even like this. But this is your path. And I will bow my knee to your path, and I will submit to it. It's one of the hardest things you will do. We don't like doing that. We've got a million reasons why this is better, and God says no. So once I'm willing to do that, he tells me, number one, to follow supernatural instruction. I'm asking God to teach me, teach me thy way. This is a strong thought. How many of you have ever taken a class in high school or college? And you say, when am I ever going to use this, right? Algebra. How many thought you'd never use algebra? I got a question. How many of you who took algebra have used it since algebra? <laughs> not you teachers, all right? I, I taught it, all right? That's, well, no, I'm, not, I'm kidding, all right? We've used it at some point. I never forget one time I walked into an English class and I heard someone say, when are we going to use this? And I'm like, apparently never. That's what I'm thinking, all right? We all had some point, some lesson, something we're taught, and we're going to say, I don't think I'm ever going to use this. And that's often what we do with God. Lord, I don't understand why you're doing this. This can't work for you. And that's why when we say, teach me, we acknowledge that he needs to be the one teaching. We need to be the one listening. We can become frustrated in these situations. We can become frustrated with the teacher. We can refuse to listen to what's being taught, which only ends up hurting us academically. Being taught being taught is based on the premise that I need to learn and need to be taught. This is the common struggle in our culture now. Today, we just want to always teach others and rarely be taught. You know what Solomon said at the beginning of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Verse 4, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, Wise men will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Wise men will hear and increase learning. That's what we need to strive for. Not to prove how smart we are. To prove how wise we are. You know there's a difference between being smart and being wise, right? You can be the smartest guy in the world and have no idea how to do something. Wisdom is practical. Wisdom I put into it. And that's what God says I need to seek after. There's supernatural instruction number two. There's a dedicated surrender. He says in verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord. Notice he didn't say, teach me a way or help me to see my way. Lord, teach me thy way. Then he says, I will follow or walk in thy truth. David promised to follow the instruction that God would give. You see, I cannot grow in Jesus if I'm not following what he is teaching. This is called surrender. When what is happening now doesn't make sense. You ever been there? Lord, I don't get why what's going on is going on. Lord, why did you allow this? Why is this happening? Sometimes we get the idea that if we're walking with God, that everything will be perfect in life. And yet, in fact, that's often the opposite. 
not only will trials of life come in, and then Satan's going to come say, I don't like Christians. He's going to come at us. It's not always easy. And God says, I have an answer, and I've got a plan. But I don't understand why you're doing this. We use phrases like, that must be a bad God sense of humor or something. We look at it. Sometimes it is. Sometimes God is trying to teach us something, so he allows us into a circumstance we don't like. So here's a really complicated, deep theological question. How many of you, since you've been saved, have ever been in a circumstance you didn't like? All right. The rest of you are trying to figure out why everybody else waved their hand. I just woke up. What's going on? All right, now. We've all, at some point, been in a situation we didn't like. It didn't make sense. It was uncomfortable. And good night, I'm a Christian. God should solve this. And then we look back and say, maybe God put me here. And that makes it even worse. I thought God was loving. He wouldn't put me here. And actually, that might be exactly the truth, that since God is loving, he put me here in this situation to teach me something. Here's a simple truth. The situation you're in right now, if you're there, God's allowed it. Okay, let me say that again. The situation you're in right now, if you're there, God's allowed it for one of two reasons. <laughs> you're in sin and God's trying to get your attention or you're walking with him and God's trying to teach you. Remember what Job said in the book of Job, when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. You remember how gold is made more, uh, more valuable? Heat is applied. It's actually turned into liquid. The dross comes to the top and the, the creator wipes away the dross more heat, more pressure, right? He says, when I am tried, I'll come forth as gold. Now, let me ask you something. You ever studied the book of Job? Job, towards the end, makes the comment, when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. You remember how God described Job in chapter 1 to Satan? Have you seen my servant Job, one who fears God and f flees from evil? God's bragging on Job. God's bragging on this amazing guy who's great, who's wonderful. And he says, Satan, he's a great servant. You got Have you seen Job? And Job says, well, yeah, he's great. You've been good to him, right? Remember that? This same God who God bragged, same guy who God bragged on in chapter 1, later in the book says this, when I am tried, I should come forth as gold. Job says, listen, I've tried to do my best, but God still has something to teach me. One of the phrases that God gives to Job in that book, I have to say, this is my opinion of God's sense of humor. He asked Job the question, where were you when I formed the foundations of the world? You ever thought through that question? It's rhetorical, by the way, because where was Job when God was creating the earth? Nowhere yet, all right? He hadn't been created. His mom hadn't been created. He was nowhere yet. It's a rhetorical question. You, you, you are so consumed. You know, we can do that. We're so consumed with right now to be in control. God do this. And God says, wait a minute. I knew what was going on before you were even in existence. I know what's going on now. Oh, no, I'm not saying it's easy. That's why God's promised to never leave us or forsake us. You know, remember this, this last um, couple of weeks, uh, we've seen, last couple of months, we've seen some weather in this part of the world we've never seen. The, the very first uh, tornado that hit right behind us took out Faulkner and the, some, some homes back there. I mean, I was driving back in, it flooded. I was driving in to see if the church had flooded. And I'm driving through and I'm seeing fire trucks and police cars and I'm seeing helicopters flying. And here's the thing, I'm like, what did I miss? I probably should watch the news, right? What did I miss? I'm like, man, and it wasn't really that dark. When I thought of tornadoes, I'm always picturing pitch black, you know, hearing the train come through, and it's not really that dark. And so I pull in, and my, my wife calls. She goes, Nathan just told me, there's a tornado in your area. I'm like, really? Not in our area. We live in the Delaware Valley off the 95 corridor. We never have tornadoes, right? Ever. So I come in, and I check the news, and, and I saw pictures of the destruction right behind us. As a matter of fact, Right here at the church down the corner, the front row of trees was demolished by this tornado. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, wow, I'm just amazed by the power of it. And then the flooding, and then Ida comes through. We've had a few remnants of hurricanes come through, but nothing like what we saw. And I said, well, what are you doing? We'll actually talk a little bit about that tonight, in my opinion of what might be going on as, as in fitting prophecy. But, you know, we, we can look at not only that, but all kinds of aspects of life. You remember when you get into those storms when you're younger? If you could just hear someone else, you knew you weren't alone in the house, it was okay, right? Was it th whatever, on Wednesday when the tornadoes came through, we had a tornado warning, then a tornado emergency. I'm not really sure what's the difference between the two, and, uh, but I think the emergency means hide. And so, but we, we didn't have, we weren't sure where to hide, so my wife's on the front porch, I'm on the back, and we're just watching. Like, I think we were more interested in seeing the tornado than we were at coming, and then I guess it hit right down, right there near the side of Burlington-Bristol Bridge. I saw the picture of it, and I'm like, 
God loves Pennsylvania more. That's all I could say at the moment, right? But I, when I, was it 100 houses taken out or something like that by that? I watched as it demolished, and I'm like, Lord, what? this is crazy. And honestly, my first thought was how quickly someone's life was just destroyed as, as they would see it. And I looked at it. I'm like, and we can sit back in those storms. We say, as long as I can see somebody. Sometimes you're in a situation where it seems like everything's falling apart. And God says, I'm not going to stop this from happening. But I will be there, and I will hold your hand through it. Years ago, I read a, uh, the old poem. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I think it was called Footprints in the Sand. I don't know if anybody even sees this. It was on my sister's wall when I was in junior high. I just kept looking at it. She had it there. I didn't think much of it. Ah, it's a verse. You know, it's a spiritual thing on the wall. I didn't think much of it. And then as I'm getting older, I just stopped one day. I think I was waiting for her. We were going to go out somewhere, and I'm waiting for her, which meant I had an hour to wait because, you know, she's a girl. Anyway, I'm kidding, all right? All right my wife will be the first to say she usually waits for me. Anyway, I got a lot of people offended on that one. But so I'm waiting for her, and I'm reading this footprints in the sand. And of course, there's a picture of, of one footprint, if I'm not mistaken. So the whole story, at least in this one I read, was that the idea was that there's footprints in the sand. You can look back and see where Jesus was walking with somebody. The, but the poem said it back. He said, but God, I look back and I struggle because the times that were hardest in my life, I only see one foot, set of footprints. I wonder, why did you leave me alone in the hardest of times? The poem concluded to say, these weren't the times I left you alone. These are the times I picked you up and carried you. And that thought hit me because there's some biblical truth behind it. We sometimes just need to surrender and say, God, this is what you have. You know, we can't be the, the, God, the, the father God wants us to be, the mother, the husband, whatever it is that God wants us to be if we won't take instruction from God and then surrender ourselves to the instruction. We won't do it. We'll never grow. Here's the thought. You're looking for God to give you some instruction. Why would God give you instruction for something when you have yet to fulfill the instruction he gave you last year? If you won't obey what you've already been given, why is he going to give you more? As a matter of fact, he says he won't. If you're faithful over little, he'll give you more. So he's not going to do it. So if I know there's things in my life that God's asked me to surrender to, and I've said no, then unfortunately he may not give me help now. Because I got some, because I won't understand this help until I deal with what God's already asked me to do. And it's usually small, simple, surrender, give an answer. Yes, get on our knees and say, God, I don't like it, I don't understand it, but I will surrender to it. Then let's look at number three, and we'll be done in a couple minutes. There's a focused attention. He says in verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Then he says, unite my heart to fear thy name. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Now, when I was growing up, the idea of fear usually wasn't good. All right, the big thing, it's still kind of a big thing today, is people love to watch horror movies, right? I want to be scared. And then they go to sleep and they stay up all night long, you know, because they can't sleep because of horror movies. One of my favorite, there's a commercial out, it's an older one, it's a Geico commercial, I think, and it's the people, and the question was, why do people in horror movies always make the worst decisions? Let's go hide behind the chainsaws in the barn, right? Don't get in the running car. Are you crazy? That's normally. That's when I watch some of these. Like, yeah, they're just dumb. Anyway, we, there's part of us that just loves to be afraid. You go to, you know, you go to amusement park. You get on. What? That roller coaster, I'm not riding that. I rode that when I was a kid. I'm going to ride this one. I want the one that's going to scare me. Just a few, uh, a couple weeks ago, we took our family to Six Flags, and Caleb and I got in the line for Joker. How many of you have ridden the Joker at Six Flags? Right, if you know what I'm talking about, only about five of us, the rest of you are too afraid, okay? Oh, you say Six Flags, that's old. We, this, this one goes in a big circle, but your seat spins the entire way you're going. So you say, that's not fearful, that's just enough to make you throw up. That's okay, it's still fun. So we're in line, it's like 400 degrees outside, and there's no shade, and we're in line, we get around, there's like 10 people in front of us, we're like, finally, we're going to get on it. And then someone comes up and says, we need to apologize, technical difficulties, the ride is currently closed. If you get out of line, you forfeit your place in line. We have no idea how long it's going to take before the ride's running. Now, this is the fourth roller coaster that day that had not worked due to technical issues. And I'm like, do I get a discount because none of your stuff works? Right? Should I get like 10% off because your, none of your stuff is working? And we sat through, we said, no, nope, we're going to wait in line. Everyone else is leaving. We're going to be the first ones on the roller coaster. And then about 45 minutes later, he looks at me, can we leave? We walked by the thing about two hours later, and it was still down. 
And I was like, that's, that's just angering. And like, man, I, want, I paid for this ride. It's like the only thing open. What we do, we love certain rides. My, son, my oldest son likes to take me on the nitro. That one doesn't go upside down. It just goes straight down. Now, they know my family growing up, I had this, I like to call it a high respect for heights, all right? What I meant is you don't jump off high things because you die. And I, I just not a fan of it. So he takes me to this roller coaster. You know, he's like, Dad, you're going to love it. I'm like, why? He's like, when you go down that hill, you feel like you're floating. I don't want to feel like I'm floating. I want to feel like I'm bolted down to a seat. But if I'm floating, the problem with floating is you hit the bottom. He goes, I know it's great when you hit there. It's awesome. Your stomach drops down and your heart drops in your stomach. And I'm like, you are sick. He's like, no, let's go. I'm literally, I'm not exaggerating the conversation a whole lot. We get in that thing, and we go up. Chink, 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 chink. Now, for somebody who's not a fan of heights, it took us nine years to get to the top of that hill. <laughs> and I'm like, are we going to get there? He looks over. Oh, we're only a third of the way up. I'm like, a third? The people below me look like ants. How are we going? I'm not exactly. <laughs> and he, chink, 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 chink. He, dad, he goes, hey, Dad, guess what? If, what if this thing broke down and we had to climb down that ladder next to him? I'm like, that's not funny. That is really not funny. And I was kidding, because I, I looked at the ladder, I'm like, that's straight down. And ching, 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 we get to the top, and, it, and you know the worst part was? Guess where my l loving oldest son, guess what seat he put me in? Front row! Do you know what happens with these roller coasters when they go over the edge in the front row? They just hang, because the rest of the roller coaster's not there yet. And so we're hanging over, and I'm holding on for dear life, like somehow I can hold myself in there, right? And my son's like, whoa, this is awesome! And he, he's, he's laughing because he knows I'm not kidding. And I'm holding on. And I'm like, we're going to die. He goes, yeah, but it'll be great. I'm like, what? And we're still slowly, for like 10 seconds, ching, ching, ching. And then all of a sudden, the ground came at me at 300 miles an hour. Straight down. He's right. We floated. We hit it. We got off the roller coaster. You want to do it again? No good true man is going to look at his son and go, no, that was scary. So what I say? Sure. <laughs> right? Because I got an ego. I'm a man. I'm not going to let my, that type, 19-year-old son think I'm not getting on it. Sure. He's like, look, the front row's open again. I'm like, what? I was thinking the back row. All right? We get on there. You know what the worst part was? The second time down, worse than the first, and I knew it was coming. And I've ridden that thing every time I go. All right? And every time, I'm scared. It gets a little bit better, a little bit there. Now, most occasions we ride those, because it's fun. We love to be feared, you know, scared a little bit. But most of us, real fear is something that overwhelms us. That's not the fear that's being mentioned in the Scripture. Ignite my heart that I might fear God. You know, when I grew up, the people I trusted the most to secure me were often the ones that I feared the most, right? I grew up, I never was afraid of a cop, but I was always respectful of them. Not because they carried a weapon, because I didn't want to get pulled over and get a ticket. That's usually what it was. The other day, we're driving home from somewhere, and I flew by a police officer, and, and usually all the cops have slowed down. Was I doing the speed limit? I won't say yay or nay. I'm preaching. I can't say that right now. But as I, I hit the brakes, so you know what we do? We could be doing 10 miles under the speed limit. We hit the brake, don't we? So I hit the brake as I'm passing the state trooper. And my wife, she just started laughing at me. She's like, they've already seen you. They're going to pull you over. They're going to do it anyway, and they're going to laugh at you while you're doing it, right? I'm like, what, do you want me to speed up by them? I don't think that's good either, all right? And she's just laughing the whole way. The guy did not follow me because I was the slowest guy on the turnpike. I'm not kidding. People are flying by me. I'm like, you need to start pulling some people over. That was my thought after he didn't pull me over, right? And people are flying by me out there. There's a, but I trust because those are also the ones that protect you. Let me tell you a couple of things about this focused attention that we see. The first of all, he talks about the idea of unite my heart. What does it mean by that? We can be so consumed with all the things of the world. And I'm, by the way, I'm not talking bad things. This is not a criticism. Consumed with wars, terrorism, consumed with COVID, consumed with masks or no masks, van vaccines or no max vaccines or this or that, or am I going to keep my job? Am I going to lose my, all these different things? We can be consumed. Then it comes down to family things. How do I pay my bill? What about this person? What if they're sick? When I wake up and I don't feel well, what about this diagnosis? And we can literally be consumed with things that are real. It's like Peter when he walked on the water. As eyes were on Jesus, he was fine. He became consumed with a real storm and the storm began to engulf him. 
You know what happens? We become engulfed with the things that are there. But that's what our focus is on. We can't sleep. We have a hard time eating. Because how do I solve this? How do I solve this? How do I solve this? And none of that, all it does is bring anxiety. It doesn't solve the problem. Because we can't solve the problem in most cases. And so we're so consumed with the world. When we go to the Bible, we struggle. Because while we're reading the Bible, we're consumed with all the other things, even now. And I'm going to be honest, we've all been there at some point. Your body's here, but your mind's 15 million miles away. I don't mean in a bad way. I mean with all those things that you have to pick back up in about 30 minutes. You know what I'm talking about? All of those things are going to hit you in the face the moment you get to your car. And they're consuming you. They bring anxiety, depression, all the, and it's just, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And here is the key. My attention can't be, no, don't get me wrong. Those things are there. We have to deal with them. But my focus needs to be on him. Now, that sounds really super spiritual. What does that mean in real life, all right? When was the last time we went to the word of God and just listened to what he said? Be in the word of God. Be in prayer. Be in church. I've, I've said this for years. I'm not a pastor that's, uh, that believes if you're not doing your devotions every so many minutes every day, you're in horrible sin. Can I tell you, we don't, should not be in the Bible because we feel like we're guilty if we don't. We should be in the Bible because we have no way to deal with life if we don't. No way to answer the questions of life if I'm not in the Bible, if I'm not in prayer. God, I don't know what's coming today. I don't know what I'm going to hear. I don't know what you're going to allow my way, but I need your strength to be able to handle it. That's what we need, our attention in his word. What did he tell us in Joshua 1.8? We should meditate therein day and night. That doesn't mean read the Bible day and night. That means my thought is in the Bible. I read it, and I meditate on the truth of it. Am I doing what he wants? Am I following his plan? Do I have a united heart? Can I tell you that while united heart often struggles with things I can't control in these battles, united heart can also go a separate way. A an un, an, 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 an non-united heart, whatever the right word is for that. We can get so consumed with my job, with money, with life, that God becomes one of the many things we do. And we've got so many other things. We've got work. And I think work's important. I think doing your best is important. I grew up, I remember I was in um, my, my first church, and our associate pastor, he's a bit of a, a spitfire, he liked to be in your face. It's just, he's still like that today. This is his style of preaching. And he made a comment. And I never heard this comment before because growing up in a preacher's home, you kind of had to come to church. But I never, he made the comment, and I've never thought of it. He said, if you want to come to church on Sunday, you, you decide to do that on Saturday. We were actually planning to do a youth activity, and the activity was going to end about 10 o'clock Saturday night. And he and my pastor said, well, you can't do it at 10 o'clock. I'm like, why not? He said, then people will have an excuse not to come to church. Everything on Saturday has got to be done by 6. I never even thought about it. You decide to come to church on Sunday. You plan it on Saturday. Here's the key. It's, it's not even about church attendance as much as it is. There's so many things in this world that are important that can grab my attention. But if I look at those, my heart is divided. What do you say in James? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't choose both. Where is my desire? Where, who am I following? I can follow the world and my desires and my hopes and then put God kind of in there somewhere and then none of it will work. It will be frustrating because it's not the way God designed it so it won't work and you're going to say, God's not listening. God's not doing this. Of course he's not because you have too many things between you and him. And he's a zealous God. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want anything else between us and him. So if I really want God to be part of my life, I need to put him first and everything else behind it. But you know what he promised us? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What are the things? Life, material things, job. Those things will be added unto you. He goes, make God number one, and he'll take care of all the other ones. But when we make those things first and put God at number ten, we can't blame God for life not working. And we say, God, well, when I'm free, when I can do this, when I can do this. We live in a day where we, as American Christians, need to stop putting God at number 10. He needs to be number one. The world needs it. Our families need it. Our, the future needs it. This world is sitting looking at everything going on, wondering, God, what are you doing? And here's the thing. Christians have the answer. And they need to see Christians. I'm not talking weird and crazy. I'm just talking that have their attention focused on him. That's what the world needs. And we can see him move in a way. That's not just for preachers. That's not just for missionaries. That's for everyone. That's what we need today. We need that so 
badly. I, I've been amazed. I wasn't, I want to bring this up a whole lot, but I've been watching a lot of preachers point out the idea that in Afghanistan right now, Christians are being brought out to, to circles and, and beheaded simply for being Christians. And a lot of preachers are saying, but we can't make Sunday. I think it's a little manipulative, but there's a little thought to it. And there, I'm going to finish with this story, then we'll be done. I started the idea with maturity, wanting, God, wanting to be able to see maturity. I'm going to give you the one, one experience in my life where I watched a hero of mine do something that still to this day, I don't know how I'd handle it. My younger sister was born with what they call congenital heart disease. Her one third of her, one quarter of her heart didn't develop. They told her there's no way she'd live past 24 hours, whatever. Well, without going into a lot of detail, she ended up living for 18 years. Well, at her 17th birthday, and she had another unique complication, so heart transplant wasn't going to work. Well, they found a way down there at St. Christopher's to be able to do the heart transplant and to, be, and to make it successful. So she went on the list, and, and she wasn't going to make it much longer anyway. So she went on the list, and, and later that, no, was it that summer, uh, what after my freshman year, she got a heart transplant. And they had some chemicals and stuff in the lungs they had to deal with. And so, and then she had some rejection medicine and, the, you know, she had some side of, you know, some effects to it. She's back and forth to the hospital. And, and then one time at camp, my brother and I worked at camp that summer and she came to see us and, and she could already see her just, the, the, the smile on her face as the energy is coming back from this organ that's working. And, and even uniquely enough, she got to meet the parents of the people. And it's a lot of unique things in this entire scenario. We go back to college, we're going on with life. The thing that we'd spent our life with worrying about was gone. We get to our sophomore year, my brother and I at the same college this semester, and, and uh, I go to I go get, on Friday, I'm going down to take a, a Greek quiz, which I always hated taking anyway, and uh, the lady knocks on my door and goes, Rodney, there's a phone call for you. By the time I got there, my brother says, we're coming home. Apparently, there had been some rejection building around the heart that they cannot diagnose, they can't see, at least at that time, and she had a massive heart attack. So we fly down to Temple University Hospital. I go in, I'm thinking, this is normal. I mean, they told us her whole life she could die. I didn't think much about this. So we walk into the hospital. My dad's there, and I could see a look in his face I've never seen before. So we walk up to the hospital. They let us to come in and see my sister and, of course, on all these machines. We go to the, emergency, we go to the waiting room, and we're waiting for a little bit. The doctor didn't have a whole lot. They're talking about a chemi- kind of mechanical heart or trying to get her a new heart. The problem they said was if she gets a new heart, more than likely her brain capacity will be minimal five, six years old because of how long she's without oxygen. And so my older sister, Tori, took us down. We're having dinner, and she looked at both my brother and I, and she goes, you have to get ready. She's not going to make this. And I just got angry. And the older sister, no, you're kidding me. So we're having a little bit of a fight down in the dining room, which is probably not abnormal in hospitals. She calms me down. I'm never, I never overreact. That's how I was really weird for me, right? So they take me up to the hospital. We go back up to the waiting room for a few hours, and then a, friend who, a person who had become a friend of the family, Dr. Donner, he walks in, he keeps telling us, he says, her heart's going, we're bringing it back, she's on a ventilator, we're still waiting for another heart or things like that, but we're not able to find one that fits what she needs, and so we're sitting there, we're talking about all these different things, mostly just talking about her, and then one time, I'll never forget this, Dr. Donner walks back in and said, we still haven't found anything, we brought her heart back a couple times, and my dad looked up at him and he said, Doc, do me a favor, next time she flatlines, let her go. I looked in the eyes of my dad. I'm like, you got to be kidding. So about a half hour later, the doctor walks in. She's gone to heaven. That's not what grabbed my attention. I heard my dad sing a song that we'd heard my whole life, usually at funerals growing up, called Finally Home. And my dad, sitting there in through tears, said this, but just think of stepping on shore and finding in heaven, a touching hand and finding a God, a breathing new air and finding it celestial. And that was my sister's struggle. And I sat there as I watched my parents through tears in complete peace when they went through something they should have never had to go through. And I remember thinking to myself that night, God, I want that maturity. But you know what? We want that power of God, but we don't want to go through the things that God puts us through there to be ready for it. And that's what this is. God are teaching me and guiding me down a path I don't want to go to unite my heart with his so that I have his grace and his strength to endure whatever comes my way. We can spend the rest of our life being baby Christians or we can follow him and allow him to do whatever he wants to do. I don't know what you're going through, but he's got a reason for it. Are you going to follow him? Are you going to surrender to him? Are you going to knot your heart with him? Or are you going to fight him? Because that's really the only options. May we today bow the knee to the God who is the only 